Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Into the 99 podcast, where we've got 99 cards because Commander is number one. I am your hostess with the most is Necrozat, and joined, as always, with some of my most treasured friends, Brian, Dan, Lotus, and Ryan. How are you guys doing today? Hello. Good. Excellent. I'm doing good over here as well. snowy, cold day. So today, I think we are talking about the reserve list, one of my most least favorite topics ever of magic. (laughs) (laughs) I'm super excited to get schooled on why my opinion's wrong. (laughs) We'll put you in my position most times if you're in gameplay. (laughs) Oh, wait, you die first? That's what... uh, I kind of like that, though. That makes people happy. So, um... (laughs) Yeah, so we're talking about the reserve list today. Does uh, someone want to take off and explain exactly what we're doing with it? Well, we'll let Ryan start it off. Ryan, yeah, what is is the reserve list? So the reserve list is a list of magic cards that will never be reprinted. And the original reasoning was to preserve their value on the secondary market. And on March 4th, 1996 is when it first appeared. Um, And some of the reasons, or some of the the definitions of what they're trying to do is the the cards will never be printed again in a functionally identical form. Uh, a card is considered functionally identical to another card if it's the same card type, subtype, has the same abilities, and mana cost, power, and toughness. The exclusion of any particular card from the reserve list doesn't indicate that there are any plans to reprint it. Uh, and the reprint policy applies to both English and non-English. Um, and it only applies to tournament legal magic cards in printed form. Yeah. So, um, what year did this list get introduced? Ninety six. Nineteen ninety six. And then so it's been re- it's been that's revised. That's kind of funny because so they put this list into place three years after like they started printing cards. So the reason that that happened is before before we get into that, I do I did want to touch on the functionally similar part. Functionally similar to them means like. The call time snow lands, like the dual lands, are not functionally similar to the normal duels, so they can print them. They come in tapped, which means that they are not as strong. And then, so there were there was also two revisions in two thousand two and two thousand ten. But what the reason that they created this policy is, um, and I don't remember the years that the two sets were created, but there was um, fourth edition and chronicles and when those sets came out there were a lot of reprints in those sets that absolutely destroyed the secondary va- secondary market value of cards from legends cards from antiquities cards from arabian nights so collectors kind of freaked out because their cards and back then the cards weren't worth what they are today but back then you know they had cards that were worth like ten dollars and there was a reprint in Chronicles, and the reprint in Chronicles was twenty five cents. And these collectors freaked out because they thought that Magic yeah. was going to continue. Wizards was going to continue to reprint cards and absolutely destroy the secondary value and collectability. Well, and their, yeah, their whole point was like it's like supposed to be a trading card game and a collecting game. And why would I bother collecting them or keeping them if I can just get them a year from now, two years from now? They're not actually worth trading if you can just keep getting them over and over and over. That makes sense. Like the Dread Mob. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean... Like like Colossal Dread Mob, exactly. But with like Black Lotus. <laughs> it's, it's not in our game, but Yu-Gi-Oh! had a lot of problems with this early on where they would say they'd have a card that was X of in every deck and it was like a $500 card and then they would put it in a $10 tin as a common six months later and it absolutely would destroy the value and people would freak out. Yeah, they... They actually had like a really weird thing too where they did, uh, they would print a card that was very, very broken so everyone needed to play it. Then they would ban it. Then everyone's value on it would drop a bunch and then they would unban it and be like, okay, well now because we have this card, here's the new problem. So we're banning card B and reallowing card A. So like their market value for things is horrible. Like, yeah. That like, sounds terrible. Magic Ugh. has been pretty consistent with its like keeping things valuable range but the other big problem with a lot of reserve list cards is they didn't understand how the game functioned either at the time magic and lotus here can attest to it is a very very complex game for everyone who doesn't know lotus is a judge and yeah there's how many questions a day do you get even just like in our discord server about rules interactions like non-stop 
Um, between the 99 Discord, my own Discord, and texts and messages, I get about 10 a day. <laughs> Especially when a new set drops. Especially when a new set drops. How does this work? What is this wording and stuff, right? So when they first printed the, obviously, like, they're called the Power Nine for a reason and stuff, right? Like, they are just cards that function significantly more powerful than anything we play with today. Like, Time Walk, a, an extra turn for two mana. You you can't do that. They they Or the, the boons. Yeah. The, you know, Lightning Bolt, um, Dark Ritual, Ancestral Giant Growth, Giant Growth, and Healing Self. It is Healing Self, yeah. Yeah. Which, like, three of those are some of the most amazing cards ever printed, and two of those are decent. Well, one of them's decent, and one of them is garbage. And one of them's white. <laughs> one exists. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a guess. Healing Solve? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Brian, not <laughs> knowing what Healing Solve does, what do you think it does in white? If Dark Ritual gives you three mana, Lightning Bolt gives you three damage. I would three life. Yep. yep. Three life versus the blue one of three card draw. Very cool. Yeah, it should have been, if I'll anything, it should have been like you go get three lands. <laughs> but that would have been busted. Print the strongest <laughs> white card ever made. So yeah, like they... Oh, God, let's go back in time. Let's change this. Yeah. <laughs> so like, obviously, Magic could not at any point predict its popularity. Like they, when they, in 1996, when they made this list, there's no way that they thought like, hey... Hundreds of thousands of people are going to, like, spend their weekends playing this. They're going to get together with their friends. Like, it's going to be all across the world. Huge, huge, like, command fest GPs. There's going to be a pro circuit. People will be making shows about it. Like, I don't believe they they ever foresaw, like, it's, like, popularity. Open the door for us. Remember when I first saw, I, I first started in Fallen Empires, but then got competitive during Invasion Block, and I rem can't tell you how many times people were like, "There's no way this game's going to make it another five years. There's no way this game's going to make it another year. Like it's just going to go the wayside, like everything else." And here we are, thirty years later, the game's stronger than it's ever been. Well, and for everyone who's played for a long time, I'm sure you've heard this is the set that killed Magic. This is this is the end of Magic. Oh, this. Every Foretell mechanic is the end of magic. Jeweled Lotus is the end of magic. during Urza's block, <laughs> Urza's block was the death to magic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, I loved Urza's. Too. I loved Urza's block. Oh, it was me. fantastic. I loved a lot of the cards in there, and yeah. they had some of the best lands, in my opinion. The uh, the thing I was I was saying though with that was that they didn't. You can't foresee how good the future is going to be. Like when they make suddenly, all of a sudden, uh, you have. Uh, what was her name? Riel the Everwise, right? Where every time you discard cards, you draw that many cards, right? So suddenly Bazaar of Baghdad just becomes a significantly stronger card. For a long time, it was like a not very good rare, very very similar to Lionized Diamond, right? There was no really yep. use for it until you got things like Dredge Decks where you're able to toss your hand out, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is great. I can still play from the graveyard and abuse these cards. So you had all these cards that just, at the time, you didn't really know the use for them or the power of them, and more and more people want them, and this is why everyone right now keeps hearing about the reserve list, is because there's just a massive price spike with all of them. So we wanted to go over like what's on the reserve list, and like we wanted to touch on that basic policy of what it is. They won't reprint it, and they won't reprint functional things. They can print Jeweled Lotus because Jeweled Lotus does not function like anything on the reserve list because nothing on the reserve list is commander-specific. So they can make they can make that. They could still make that meme card of Colossal Lotus that is tapped for six mana for only Colossal Dreadmoth. It could happen. <laughs> That's funny. That like, and and, and I feel that we that. I feel that we all have a different opinion on the reserve list too. Like I think it's it's a very sensitive topic in the community. Because I think everyone has their own take on it because like i kind of side more on the collector side of things and i know a few of you are more on the game centric type of things and then, actually this was a this was a big conversation in our discord i just <clears throat> i never see like so if they reprinted black lotus tomorrow right i don't think the price of an alpha black lotus is ever going to plummet 
like the price of you know the black lotus that would be printed in like an unsafe pool set tomorrow or something stupid like that the collecting mm-hmm. aspect an alpha card is still always going to be more viable the same thing we see like with sarah angel sarah angels from alpha are still very expensive as opposed to just one out of like one of the core sets yep so the collectability is still there it doesn't you know degradate the price or the card or the power it just makes it more viable for people to get into their hands. So to give you an example of what you said, an Alpha Black Lotus, there were only 22,800 copies printed. I think it's lower than that. I think it was, uh, I thought it was only 11,000 total existence because there was only and the the so Chase Rares, was 22,000. I believe that's for the Dual Lands. And I'm pretty sure that Alpha only has 11,000 to ever exist. I could be wrong so on that. This was on the, the Wikipedia of the Power 9. They say if each of the Power 9 there were only 22,800 printed. Yeah, that's that's that in total. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's 22,800 that are still exist. A lot of these there it's very rare but there still are sealed pro, there still is sealed product out there. There are still I mean there are the, the ones that, you know, Tommy mom and dad bought Tommy 10 packs of cards and he opened them up and they got thrown in the garbage because back in 93 because they didn't know what they were. Versions that got destroyed in floods or water damage. And just to kind of just kind of reiterate my point, but like with Sarah Angel, like just going off the of Star City's website, a Sarah Angel that's so sold out right now from Alpha near Mint is seven hundred dollars, as opposed to a Sarah Angel from Tenth Edition as a rare for fifty nine cents. Like so, I yeah. Part of that also, though, there's a format called Old School Magic where you can only play with those original printings. Oh, and you, yeah, they're, like, you can't play your fourth edition version in the deck. You can only play Alpha, Beta, Unlimited. So that before all this crazy reserveless buyout stuff started happening, those cards started creeping up simply because those were the versions that you could play in that format. But it still reinforces my point, the fact that these cards will still hold their value regardless. I, I did so, want to, okay. sorry, I, I I found an answer. I, I wanted to jump in. 1,100 Alpha Black Lotus has ever existed. Wow. Okay. So that 22,000, maybe that was Alpha Beta Unlimited. Yeah, that, that'll be the combined. total Power 9, which is why they're like so expensive, is that like they're, for they each of exist. those cards, there should be around 22,000 that exist, which is not enough. Nope. <laughs> there's only a few hundred there's only a few hundred thousand uh dual lands of each dual land to ever exist and like a hundred a few hundred thousand sounds like a lot but there's millions of magic players i wonder how many well that doesn't matter how many magic players are active magic players are actually are oh i think on arena there's there's a fair bit i'll while you guys talk about the reserve list i'll find out how many active magic players on arena so there has been Oh, go ahead, Zach. But I've always been very frustrated with that because, like, I'm very, you guys know how I am. I'll proxy stuff, even stuff that I have, just because I like doing, you know, themed arts and what have you. I've always been very frustrated as a commander player because, like, I want everyone to be on the same page. I want everyone to play whatever they want to play. And for a while, I was a very big elitist. And I'm glad I grew out of that because I just want people to play. Like, if you want to sit down and play a stupid tribe that has no support, but you want to play with all the dual lands and everything you possibly can so that it can at least be viable. Dude, I don't care if you write on the write on lands that this is, you know, this mountain right here, it's not a mountain, it's actually a backlands. Whatever. I, I don't care. I wish that these cards were more accessible to people. Like that's why I'm like such an you know, a big proponent of proxies now. Like I want everyone to play what they want to play. I never want someone to be, you know, locked out of the game because of price. I think that is one of the most frustrating things. Like, we use it to our advantage, for sure. You know, when I want to trade for cards, like, yeah, I'm glad these cards have a value. But at the end of the day, like, if it meant everyone could actually play with dual lands, even if they made gold border ones or something like that, I would 100% be about that product. Well, what you said right I, there I, is, I, I just, what you said right there is part of their definition. They can still print gold border ones of those cards. Nothing tournament legal, but EDH is in a tournament format. That's like the nice thing about our thing is there. I don't think there's a way to ever actually truly have EDH be a sanctioned tournament format with four players. So gold border cards suddenly aren't a big deal. How often do you see people actually playing unsleeved decks, right? The backing of the card doesn't really matter. Like through, I personally love Eclipse sleeves. They're fully blacked out. I love them because I play a lot of the flip cards. Eclipse sleeves are the best sleeves. 
Katanas are horrible. Get out of here. Just kidding. Sponsor us. Sponsor us. Any sleeves. But uh, but no, like I I I've yet to see a thing. If somebody sat down and they played like a gold border guy as Cradle, for instance, I I don't know a single player. And again, I, I'm not speaking for everyone, but I don't know a single player who would have a problem with that. Right? Like it's still it's still technically a real card. Right. It's just so funny that it's so funny to me because you guys know my love for the gold border cards. Like I have in many, and not even because of price, but I've had in many occasions where I've had the option where I could get a normal version of Blood Crypt or I could get the gold border, and I want the gold border because I just think the gold borders are so cool. <laughs> One of the our crazy man. thing, about, sorry, just for a gold border Gaius Cradle are like a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. They are yeah, for twenty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> One of the people we play with has a signed uh, Force of Will gold border, and yeah, they just look so good. That's awesome. Well, going back cards. to your last thing of how many players are in Magic compared to how many Power 9 were actually released, mm-hmm. um, across 70 countries, there are 35 million players. Yeah. So, so that's that kind of goes into the biggest problem I personally have with the reserve list, is there is nowhere near the supply for even, even a, like a portion of the demand for it right like people people like dual lands they like to see their decks go off and everything dual lands and fancy lands fancy cards will not make you a better player but they will make it easier for you to more consistent to have your game plan going and stuff right that's why most like competitive decks run these lands and not basic lands right that's not why there's I, i've yet to see a cdh list that runs the guild gates right you can you can color fix for cheap but like you're paying for the speed and there, like I said, there's not there's not a supply for it. There, you said there's 35 million players or something. Yeah. There's not. You couldn't even give like one percent of each player a dual land. Like there's there's just not enough. Like I said, there's only in the hundreds of thousands of dual lands. It's not millions. There's not five million of each. There's a really small. And then obviously the power nine is banned in Commander, right? Minus time twister. So it's not a huge those being reprinted don't really matter so much to us, but a lot of formats would love to have like those moxes come back. A lot of people would love to play that high power stuff where they can oh, drop a Black had, Lotus. If I legit had the accessibility to play Vintage, I would play Vintage. Vintage is an amazing format. So I'm, I don't. I, I've never sorry. got to play Vintage, but I've watched a lot of people play Vintage, and it just seems the like the bonkers stuff that I like about Legacy and Commander but to 10, you know, like, it's just, it seems so cool, but Wizards isn't about supporting these older, or these other formats. They would rather Legacy die than give us product that we need. Well, they also but don't they make could, money on Legacy. They could. could. So, but I think, like, Wizards can print something close to it, like, give it a different name. It's like They it, can't it's function like, the same. They can't. It's functionally the same. They can't even do like Wheel of Fortune in blue because it's the same card. Yeah, like for for example, like uh, Winds of Change is one red. Everyone discards and has as many cards as they have. That's fine. It doesn't function like Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune is everyone gets seven new cards. So you're at a great advantage if you can empty your hand minus that, cast it, yeah. and then suddenly Brian's got to throw away seven good cards. We both get seven, right? They can windfall and everyone gets the advantages or... But you'll never get a card that's functionally the same, right? Like, they're never going to do two mana Black Lotus. Uh, I miss playing, I miss playing uh, Space to Neo Pokemon because we had Professor Oak, and that was, that was Winds of, uh, I'm sorry, Will of Fortune. And Watsi, it's funny because Watsi was printing Pokemon at the time when this card existed, and they didn't change the rules, so that's what you would see. You would see these vintage formats like, Face Neo for Pokemon doing multiple Wheels of Fortunes a turn, and it was it was absolutely wild. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like Wheel of Fortune's a great card, but they just like they can't. They they tried recently with Wheel of Misfortune, right? But it's like a weird. You got to jump through so many hoops to get the similar kind of effect. And it's one a cool card. <laughs> it, it, it is a cool card, but like one person still kind of gets hosed on it, and like there's there's not a good solution to it, right? Because both sides of it. Collectors want people to not, players want people to generally reprint them and stuff, right? And everyone in between just kind of wants to play Magic. They want to, like, we're going to go over some of the stuff that's actually on the reserve list, and you'll see 
what I mean, a lot of it is pointless. Like, there's no reason for Mountain Goat. We always joke about that card before we did it with Sherman <laughs> way back in the day. There's no reason that's a reserve list card, right? Like, nobody nobody is, like, going to be breaking the game by playing their new Mountain Goats, right? When you look at Birds of Paradise, Birds of Paradise has, like, an alpha printing. It's still valuable, and people still love Birds of Paradise. I, Birds of Paradise is a great card in any deck that is more than one color in green, and even in a just green deck. Like, See... I had a thought um, when you were mentioning the fact that collectors were worrying about their cards devaluing when they inter, uh, introduced the reserve list. Mm -hmm. So when did Anti leave? And did Anti have anything to do with it? I don't think Anti had anything to do with it because Anti wasn't used on like the competitive stage. Like I think it's always, I think Anti's always been banned once they had a competitive format. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was around for a while. No, but I mean, like, like F&Ms and, like, your Grand Prix and your Pro Tour, there was never anti on any of those those stages. Because you, the problem you ran into is if, like, if you and I played and we put a card up for anti and I lost my card, my deck is no longer tournament legal. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I, I don't know how it coincides with any because i know for as long as i can remember anti has always been banned in in sanctioned play but that's you know as far back yeah. as i can remember i just wondered if that sparked the argument of valuable in cards no it was straight up it it, it was for, fourth edition in chronicles was what why this mm. all all happened and why the policy came out was because of they printed those sets and it just destroyed the secondary market and people freaked out because they were afraid. Like, you weren't even talking about, like, they didn't reprint, like, power or anything. They were printing, like, the legendary dragons from, and, like, City of Brass and Blood Moon and some well, of those Everyone cards. thought those cards were actually good back then. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't that. It was, <laughs> people were concerned, if Watsy does this, what's going to stop them from, from reprinting duels and power and and these cards that are old and collectible that we own, what's going to stop them from <laughs> old, doing? Old and collectible, three years. Ooh wee. <laughs> yeah, but Ryan, if you, if you had, a, but if you had a hundred dollar card, uh, go back ahead. then, I mean, hundred bucks was a lot of money. Like I, I remember power for a hundred dollars, and you know when you're a sixteen year old kid trying to come up with a hundred bucks, that's a ton of money. There's uh, and then it was banned uh, after two thousand and one. Anti was. Yep. Because people played it at the 2001 Invitationals because there was no uh, rules enforcement really? that stopped it at the time. I so after yeah, right after 2001, it was banned. It was last used in Homelands, but yeah, like people, uh, it, it still it says is. in the comprehensive rules that you may play for anti. It says like you can do this, but not at any WPN place. And it says if it's illegal to play for keeps because it's kind of like gambling, then then you can't do it in your country if it's illegal. But like that's like that's the comprehensive oh. rules is that it's still a optional format of magic. Maybe it's just because I didn't play the formats where the cards were legal. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, I know they uh it, it was a weird it was a very weird thing to just like take a card from your deck and be like, We're gambling this. Well I know like with, with the reason like we are talking about this is there's been recently a lot of like big spikes in reserve list buyouts. And it is the it's like, in my opinion, I like we're playing a game. Like, yeah, there's the collectability of it, but I, and like Zach said, I just want to play the game. And I don't want something like this policy or people speculating on cards or driving, artificially driving up prices of cards. Like, they don't, most of these guys don't play the game. They're just buying it because they're like, hey, this card's like Lotus and I were talking, like Eladomri, Lord of the Leaves. I bought mine about a month ago for 40 bucks, and now it's like $140, and that's happened overnight. Uh, a fun and, thing to know before, like, before we talk about, like, the speculation is magic cards, especially the Power 9 in particular, have outperformed every stock, interest, and bond, with the exception of Bitcoin, for, like, the last 15 years. If yeah, you, if you had just, yeah, if you had just invested only in Power 9 cards versus gold on an even basis you would be significantly richer from now, like power that, nine cards is that strictly buying the power nine or is that considering like the people that are buying them and having them graded and selling them for a hundred times the value both like just okay. all of it like the 
the cards of like these prices aren't for graded ten ones. Like a graded ten Black Lotus just went for like five hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Five hundred eleven. Five hundred eleven. It was five hundred eleven. Yeah, like it's that. That's what I mean, right? Like the that's the insane the forty thousand yeah. dollar price tag on a Black Lotus is just for your your common poor man's Black Lotus. That's not a graded ten. <laughs> Right, like it's um, <laughs> the the buy list is because of that like insane like first and foremost I I want to talk about their thing. They made a promise. They can at any time break the promise. The idea that anyone is going to sue Wizards of the Coast is literally nothing but fantasy. You don't have any standing to do so. You would have to prove that you like bought these cards with like the intent to invest and stuff. And you know what I mean, like the. You'd have to, like I said, you'd have to show that you were damaged by it, right? And well, what a like, Black Lotus is. Like, all my cards, I didn't pay for any of these cards even near the value and stuff. We were talking about, I have, uh, like, multiple Time Twisters. One of them's a beta one. There is nothing that could ever make me pay a fraction of what it is worth right now. Like, I could win the lottery, and I would not spend, uh, it's 32000 US dollars for, like, a beta one right now. Wouldn't do it, right? So... How do I, how would I go about showing wizards that they damaged me? Like, I don't have a receipt from when I was like collecting cards when I was in 1997. Like, it doesn't even matter. It'd be like buying Toyota stock and then Toyota tomorrow saying, Hey, we're going out of business. Your, your, your stock's useless. So, like, sorry, you shouldn't have bought it. You you could (laughs) try, but like, the, the cost to like, the cost to try to sue wizards versus wizards and Hasbro, who, as every corporation does, they pay for lawyers. Like, they're not paying legal fees. They, like, pay lawyers salaries for the year to be on that. Like, they have no problem. You have to go to them. You might class action lawsuit them, and they might lose $100 million, a few hundred million dollars, but it's going to equate to, like, a $5 payout. It's not worth everyone's time to try and actually sue them. Like, no matter, game stores would be hosed. They would, they would lose a lot of money in general. But Wizards has so much money that they can just be like, we're going to give you free boxes for the next year enjoy it done right like it's you know what i mean like (laughs) wizards can easily make them whole like they can they can easily be like you know what like we're breaking the reserve list but like we are going to give each game store owner foil version of every value card on it printed as a we're sorry one of a kind here's this like nothing stops them from doing uh alternate art things nothing stops them from doing small really cool things like their christmas gifts like the top deck of the halls for example they can do whatever they want. They could give everyone like the has anyone have you guys seen their like soul, the the one it's like the dragon they gave to the employees and stuff? Yeah, like yep. they could give every game store owner one of those, be like, here, this is yours, you can sell it, whatever you want to make up your money. Like nothing stops them from saying sorry, where it, it's only their promise, right? So the only reason that they actually haven't broken the reserve list is because they don't need to. But, like, every year that there's more and more, like, counterfeit cards because, like, that is what, like, a lot of proxies are. There's definitely support, like, people that are, like, making your alternate arts of, like, uh, full art dual lands and stuff like that. Things that, like, they function that way. We can all tell what it is. It's supposed to be a volcanic island. But there there is a really big problem with, like, people printing, like, exact replica copies, especially of those old cards. There's no holograph. There's not the security features of new stuff. People are just making counterfeit cards, and Wizards is going to eventually, they can't have it go on forever, right? You're never going to stop the problem of people printing $5 sets of dual lands that look functionally the same until you yourself start supplying those dual lands again. Yeah, it give people a reason not to shop. P- yeah, people just want that overseas. stuff, and and those cards, even... th- those ca- those counterfeit cards are really, really dangerous to like new collectors and new players who who don't understand because I'm everyone has that like story of like, Oh, like, you know, like I was looking through this old collection and there was a mox in it and stuff. You didn't, you didn't get a mox for like $10 with like a bunch of, a bunch of M 10 cards. Like, no, right. Like, like there's, I don't even really think though that like if they were to, if they were to break the reserve list tomorrow, I don't even think stores would really lose out because if they were to break it tomorrow, that means that they're going to print product that has these cards in it. Did you... you could not <laughs> keep boxes in stock. If you, say, yeah, if like if you put like the like you know the inventions or the invocation style, mm-hmm. if you put dual lands in boxes like that, those would never even you would pre sell out of those them. before like before the whole set was spoiled. They could just say this is what the next set's box topper potential is. It'd sell out. It would not matter what was in it. People would go crazy. It's me. I'm people. 
was going to say, not to throw shade at you and your brothers, but look what happened with Commander Legends at your store. Yeah, we bought my store out. <laughs> Could you imagine if, all right, next core set, um, you know, the, the like you said, the box topper could be one of the dual lands. My, uh, one of my little brothers, he opens cards in what I think is a hilarious way, but it like makes a lot of people angry. Uh, he'll go and like buy like pack, like boxes of like Kaladesh, Amon Cat, like any of those things. And he will stand at the counter, like crack, look at the rare, drop the cards and that's it. And like, he doesn't keep any of them. He doesn't look through it. He's only looking for inventions and he'll do that probably once or twice a week. He'll just go to a store, buy a box and he's just trying to find inventions. Wow. I don't even think that anymore. I don't think the stores would be damaged by the abolishment of the reserve list because most stores are getting bought out. Like my two of my like super local stores, they have nothing on the reserve list in their store because they're continuously bought out. And then uh, one of my good buddies owns a store and he has a, a guy, a customer that's on a standing order. If you want to call it that, that whenever a reserve list comes in, in he just puts it aside and the guy buys it. Sight unseen, doesn't matter the condition, doesn't matter the cost, he just buys it. Yeah. There, there's so some people never... that just, they care about collecting those cards or they play those formats, right? Like they they know that they're going to be expensive and they're willing to drop like $1,000, $2,000 to get those dual lands so other people can't have them. And I mean, even a lot of stores, like your power now, most stores don't have that kind of capital laying around to when somebody walks in with a $42,000 Beta Twister to buy that Twister. Like, I don't know many stores that have, you know, $25,000 liquid cash to buy a single card that they might sit on for a year or two years or three years. But the the thing is, the the way that, like, store economies work is they're not paying that for it. You bring in a $30,000 card and they'll say, they'll say, I'm going to give you $10,000. Oh, no, they they wouldn't give you 20. For for most, like, high value cards, anything like over a thousand, most places will only offer you, like, 50% of its value. If they're, they even offer anything at all, they might just pass on it because they don't. Yeah, have they, they might say no. Yeah. They might say you can have sixty percent of its value in like <laughs> credit overall, but like, yeah, like you're you're never gonna. That's that's why you see so many of these things getting listed for the prices, and that that's another big reason that the prices look so high. It's individual sellers lift, listing these cards, not stores, because stores can't keep them in. Stores put them up for what is a reasonable price for the store, and that's why they go. But like, I'm not a store. I'm just. I'm just Daniel from like Alberta. So if I put my card up and I want it for, I, I want to put my twister up for $32,000, it's not hurting me for it to not sell. Like it's not, it's not something that I'm waiting for. Right. So that's why you see those. And then people average the price out based on like what is listed. They see, well, this is $32,000. I'm going to list mine for 29,000. Then suddenly, well, 25,000. And then, okay, 25,000 is the going rate. And then all of a sudden these cards just go <laughs> up and up and up because you can't keep them in stores because stores try and sell at a reasonable price and yeah. they're gone. Yeah. That's that's what happened with my Wheel of Fortune. Like I just got I got tired of it. Honestly, I didn't need it. And I saw how it spiked. So I was like, I'd rather have new product and build a new commander deck than hold on to it. I took it into my LGS and they looked at it in the condition and my buddy was just like, I, I don't want to lowball you on this, but he's like, I don't know that I can buy this because I don't think I could make any money off of it because of how expensive it is. Well, and let's be honest, no one, no one's seen black lotuses in their store cases. You, you'd have to have like bulletproof glass to do that because glass isn't going to stop you. And a forty thousand dollar like grab and go is not something people are gonna like it's gamble a really good on. Payoff. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, it's pretty easy to 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 bust a cabinet and then go to a GP two states away and hawk it, or go to a store two states away and hawk it, or know? hold it for four years and let it go up seven thousand more dollars. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, or send it off and get it get it graded and then <laughs> yeah so a hundred times the price it's so it's a in Saudi Arabia yeah so like we'll we'll talk a little <laughs> bit about uh we're gonna talk about our like individual thoughts on it I'm pretty sure spoiler alert everyone knows mine but uh, I wanted to go over like wizards did a few things so like we want to do what their first list was and then the two revisions why they had to make these revisions and again why you're never going to sue them if they break the list because they've broken it many times and no one has ever successfully sued them for it because you, you can't. Spoiler, spoiler alert, you cannot do it. It, it, just, it won't work. So their, fir- so their first list was all cards from Alpha and Beta that had not appeared in 4th edition or Ice Age, all uncommon and rare cards from Arabian Nights and Antiquities that hadn't been reprinted in White Border at the time, and all rares from Legends and the Dark that had not been reprinted in White Border. 
So and then, oh, go ahead. Uh, do you want me to touch the the next one, or do you? Uh, yeah, to... just go go through the addition. So we're we're actually just going okay. through like uh the the magic wiki has like a pretty decent like write up of of what's on it and the because it is some long articles to go through. So we just wanted to so do the, the summary. Yeah. So you go with the subsequent ah, subsequent editions. So they reserve the right to reprint cards from Fallen Empires, Ice Age, and Homelands, and subsequent limited edition or limited expansion sets, as well as cards from Chronicles, in order to maintain the collectability of these products. However, they would reprint in white border no more than 25% of the rarest cards. And then in conjunction with the release of each new core set, such as 5th edition, Watsi would announce which sets were considered eligible to have cards from them rotated into the core set, and any rare card from those sets not rotated into the core set at the time would become a reserved card and thus would never be printed again. So that's mm-hmm. how you're going to get some of these really wonky cards on this reserve list because they didn't make the reprint in a core set. So how did my, my question is, how did we get um, uh, that black enchantment from Arabian Nights that every proper player wanted into Double Masters? Be like, that, that's what it is. Because it was reprinted. It had already had a reprint. So I thought it was only, I thought it was only printed in Arabian Nights. What are they reprinted in? Uh, I can't remember, but it was. It's an. No, it's another old one. No, you know why? It's because. Hold on, where did Dan say this? Because it was a common in Arabian Nights, so they could. It was all uncommon and rare cards from Arabian Nights that had not been reprinted at the time. Gotcha. Okay. So because yeah, they, it it doesn't hit that. It was then eligible for a reprint. I just assumed it wasn't uncommon because it wasn't uncommon in Double Masters. I didn't know what the actual rarity was. That makes a lot more sense, though. Well, then you you do have some sets that, like, where they talk about Chronicles and Homelands and Fallen Empires don't have rares. They have our uncommon one and uncommon two. So they have more uncommon, or they have a rare, un, a rarer uncommon and a more common uncommon. Yeah. Interesting. That's <laughs> odd. It's confusing. Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, you think they should have just started the uh, the mythic rare stuff sooner? But that's what they wanted to do, you know. <laughs> well, that was their chase to make more money, but that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> so, like in two thousand and two, they like changed up a little bit with Mercadian masks. Uh, common, uh, commons and uncommons from limited were removed from it due to the overwhelming public support for this change, which everyone still supports. <laughs> everyone but Brian. But uh, so it said the exception was Pharaoh's Bands from Homeland, which was reprinted in fifth edition, but mistakenly still on the list at the time. It was also removed. Then their 2010 revision policy is uh, the original policy only applied to non-premium cards, meaning that reserve list cards could still be printed as premium exclusive cards like uh, your foil Gaia's Cradle. So when it was applied to the dual decks Phyrexia versus the Coalition and from the Vault Relics, the Magic's community reaction were largely or to a large extent negative. Because magic players are babies, I will say it all. Everyone likes to complain about everything, and it just is what it is. So starting in 2011, no cards on the reserve list would be printed in either premium or non-premium form after that. So they're just like, fine, we won't make your special cool cards because you guys cry. So first off, that, stop that, being I'm toxic to that. wizards all the time. Yeah, like, I'm I'm fine with that. Like, if they want to print something but in a different art and, like, say, like a... Um, like a foiling, because a lot of the older cards didn't have foils. Mm-hmm. Like, if they want to do that, like, I would be fine. As long as it's not, like, the same art and things like that, that that's where I think some of the the value lies. So, like, the Force of Will box stopper. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think Force of Will is actually even on the list. No, no, it, it's no, not, It's not. It but, like, example. it's like a, it's an extra okay, artwork sorry, of sorry. something that's, like, different, right? And, and all the all the from the vaults. Yeah, well, and hmm. old Force of Will doesn't like it's not like a ten dollar card suddenly because they reprinted it. It's still pricey. It's actually I think worth more than the the non foil version of Force of Will. So like your your regular basic Force of Will that was reprinted in like Double Masters, it's worth less than the Alliance's version. I hate Force of Will, so I don't care. <laughs> I think it's just play out. I only play white counter spells, so there you go. <laughs> but yeah, so like it's first off, they did remove a bunch of things from the reserve list, and everyone's like, "Yay, this is great!" And then they're like, "We're gonna print these like cool versions." And then people threw a big tantrum, just like they do every time they print 
anything. Every set, can you guys stop? Every set is jeweled lotus. Well, this is needs to be banned. Like, let's let's see how the cards are before we all publicly blow up about everything. Oh, it's yeah, like it's such a pet peeve of mine that like every card they're like this breaks the game, this wrecks the whole game. Can't get this. Like the play them first. Play them. Don't don't spend your day yelling at wizards. They they get it. <laughs> I really wish Wizards would go back to printing dual decks and from the vaults. Those are my two favorite products. Ooh, I, absolute... I gotta, I gotta disagree there. Their dual deck replacements are so good. These commander precons, oh, so good. I love them. I still, I still love them. And I, or even if they like, if they didn't redo dual decks, like give me back from the vaults and premium decks. Like I got into Legacy because I got four grave boards for Christmas one year. That's fair. Doing like, that yeah. commander edition. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I'm with. I'm with you, Zach. I love the from the vault stuff. I, I also I really did like the from the vault, but uh, I think the reason they stopped is they just sat for too long at a lot of places. I think a lot of store owners were really unhappy with them because, like, well, initially I, they were amazing, but then they just like some of them were just like, "Why would I buy this? It's just full of garbage." I think now, though, like, I think with the kind of collectability that, because, I mean, obviously, Magic has always been a collectible card game, but I think since we've seen so many more um, different versions of cards, and now it's, like, a normal thing to have secret layer versions, to have, you know, showcase arts and alternate arts, whatever, I think um, From the Vaults cards would do better now than what they used to do, because now the market is, like, used to it, you know what I mean? Let's uh, be honest, they still do have From the Vault. They just call them Secret Lair, and they come very cursed. I was just going to say. Yeah, yeah, like, now they just, the stores don't get them. Wizard sells them specifically, and like I said, their foiling is horrendous. And they're probably in print on demand. I'm not Whereas sure if that's the case. From the Vault's printing was better. Their foiling was I better. love the From the Vault foils, and everyone complains about them too. all the time. I thought that the they only, looked so the good. The only concern, as a, like, so I used to play very, very competitive Magic, and the problem, the From the Vaults were noticeably thicker. And you could, to some degree, say they were marked inside decks because you could feel the difference in a sleeve. Hmm. I never noticed. Interesting. I don't think I ever noticed. You're still only drawn from the top, though. Drawing a thicker card from the top, I feel like, wouldn't matter because I always present my deck to be cut, so. Yeah, but sometimes you can cut. In an long. official tournament, if a card is physically different in the deck, it's gotta be, yeah. it would be mate marked, just okay. in case someone could tell from the shuffle. Mm-hmm. We did a, I, I can't, I want to say it was modern. We went to a modern tournament and I had one from the vault card in my deck because I could not find a regular version. And at the FNM beforehand, we were shuffling the deck and every single time you could present the deck and I could cut to it. And I ended up having the next day go to the, the GP, the G, I think it was a GP. I had to go to the GP and find a version of the card to replace it with because I was like, I can cut to this every single time. Fair. It's like the recent GP, not recent because it's a few years ago now, but um, Nexus of Fate, GPs around uh, my way were actually giving out proxies because every single one was warped. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yep. Okay, so do we want to go over? Like, I'm, I'm going to quickly touch, touch on, on the sets that are can, like that have reserve list cards in them. Sure. So we have the limited editions, we have Arabian, Antiquities, Legends, uh, the Dark, Fallen Empires, Ice Age, Homelands, Alliances, Mirage, Visions, Weatherlight, Tempest, Stronghold, Exodus, Urza's Saga, Urza's Legacy, Urza's, Urza's Destiny. And then things that recently came off, there's like a really short list of things that came off in 2002. That's Basalt Monolith, Camouflage, Clone, Consecrate, Land, uh, Copper Tablet, Demonic Tutor, Dwarven Demolition Team, Earthbind, False Orders, Guardian Angel, Ice Storm. Yeah, try pull these up, Brian. Invisibility, Jade Statue, Juggernaut, which and Juggernaut's been printed in everything. Uh, Lance, Living Wall, Nettling Imp, Psionic Blast, Regrowth, Resurrection, Sacrifice, Sinkhole, Pharaoh's Ban. So, like, not exciting things that actually came off. Minus Basalt Monolith, of course, because Basalt Monolith's great. Uh, demonic Tutor? Yeah, I, I, I guess Demonic, demonic Tutor. Yeah. Demonic Tutor's great. That's okay, two cards. <laughs> <laughs> not the Free way I play. Very, regrowth is very good. No, not but there's some sets like Mirage and... Um, homelands they have no business being on them there's nothing good in those sets well the we we keep coming back to like the value of it and stuff they're always going to be uh it's always going to be valuable to have cards that weren't printed a lot regardless of like their new sets really good example is arabian knights mountains are expensive 
because they just didn't have a lot of mountains in the set for some weird reason. So, like, they've always been expensive. But, like, literally, like, who pays for basic lands? Let's be real. You go to your you, store and just say, hey. you have them? You go to your store and say, hey, can I have some lands? And they usually throw them at you. See, I buy all my, every basic land in every one of my deck is, like, full art. Like, they're premium basics. I don't use any. Yeah, if there's snow lands. The, I, I couldn't only... do that. That'd be too crazy. That's because you have, like, 275 decks. The only specific basic lands I ever went out of my way to get were a specific uh, swamp in foil from, uh, what set was that? It was an Urza set, I want to say, because it looked like, it looked like Urborg. For me, the o- are, for me, the only one I've ever all. done is the Morning Tide and, like, Shadowmoor ones. I love those lands, those swamps and islands. They're, those are very good. Yep. Those are, those are really good ones. Those are my favorite. Favorite basic lands, if anyone's wondering, except for the new snow land from Kaldheim. So, I really like that owl. I knew you were going to say yeah. <laughs> my, my favorite lands, the Urza Saga Forest. Yeah, that oh, is I'm that is a good one. Urza Saga Basics. Um, so I did want to go over just some of the like silly prices on some of the recent cards. Like we're gonna we're just gonna quickly touch on why, like what these prices are, because like it's very easy to say like, oh yeah, the reserveless prices are too high and stuff. We're going to skip anything that's, like, not legal to us. But, like, we'll just, like, start it right off with uh, the first one, Tabernacle. Tabernacle is legal in EDH. It's $10,000 now. Why? I ain't buying it. <laughs> Why? The, like, the Mists of Pendril Veil vale is, like, still, like, that's another reserveless card. But it's, like, price mages of the Tabernacle is, like, a dollar, you know, as a creature. Why, Why is this a $10,000 card? I understand rarity, but, like. I've, unless you owned one before, you're not playing this. Like, there's, if you wanted to play Tabernacle, it's a very annoying card. I will be the first person to admit it. I've never seen someone 100%. happy. Someone happy that I put down a like you, Tabernacle. For anyone who doesn't know and has good friends, uh, it's all creatures okay. require an upkeep cost of one in addition to uh, uh, like other upkeep costs they have. If you can't, they're destroyed. So if you can make your creatures indestructible, not your problem. And if you're playing like a sacrifice deck that recurs things, like you're playing a Theros, for instance, and you wanna you want people to be like, hey, do you want to pay 30 life or can I have these cards back? Right? It, then it's not a problem. But for a normal game, like if you put this down against an elf deck, like you don't have friends anymore. <laughs> yeah, Dan. It's <laughs> it, it's a card I like. There's uh, functional reprints of it. There's fu- Except it's not a land, it's a creature. Um, yeah. But you have Magus of the Tabernacle, which is currently at $1. Yeah, that's like... Well, it's not a functional reprint, then, because it's a creature. No, what I'm saying is you can get the same effect. The same effect, yeah. It's... But then you have things like, again, another high-value card on the list. We have Mishra's Workshop from Antiquities at $7,000. Why? That's the... That's awesome. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I understand it's rare, but, like, it taps to add three colorless mana to your mana pool, only for artifacts. We play, like, theme-based decks. Like, there's lots of, like, Duretti decks. There's lots of, like, Urza. Of course, Urza needs more mana, but you know what I mean? Like, there's... People would like this. People would like to play with a card like this because there's many artifact decks that would really be able to go off with this one land. And you can't tell me that this is, like, more broken than, like, a Sarah Sanctum in, like, different situations. You can't, like, Sarah Sanctum, Gaia's Cradle, any of those things. Like, they're... It's not a game-breaking card. It's a very strong card. But, didn't but, Mistress Workshop get a reprint though? Sure like, didn't. Sure oh, no. didn't. Only, only in. Uh, you're thinking of. You're thinking of Factory. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's like, easy to confuse it too. Urza, Urza's Land Power Plant, all that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, like, yeah it, it's, I, I have it in my. I have a proxy of it in my card deck, and it is. It is very powerful. It is. It's great. Uh, but it's one of those things, like you said, like, it, I'm in a colorless artifact deck. Yeah. You. You need some support. Yeah, like that's that's really the only place you're gonna see it because otherwise it's a useless land. Yeah, it doesn't even like it's not even like hey, this is great for Eldrazi to ramp to them. They're not artifacts. Like it's not for colorless yeah. spells. You're not dropping Ugin with this. No. Like you no. said exactly. Like it's like it's for like a Karn Silver Golden deck. I have one. It's in Brutaclad. It's not even it's not even a good deck. It just <laughs> it's full of artifacts. Like it it's fun to play cards that have them. And like again, the the issue I have is that. The reserve list, so I'll, I'll get into my, my big gripe with the reserve list. It's, they're all legal cards. If your problem is the card, 
then the card shouldn't be legal and stuff, right? It, it's really easy yeah. to say like, hey, like Mishra's workship, uh, workshop, ship, <laughs> Mishra's <laughs> workship, ahoy, uh, would yeah. break the game, you know? Like if you say like, oh yeah, okay, like this is a fundamentally unfun card to play against. It wrecks it. It gives too much advantage. Like therefore, I don't believe it should be in the game. That's a very different argument than you don't deserve it, peasant. Like it's, you know what I mean? Like there, there's, they're very, very different points. And that's my big problem with it is like none of these cards are illegal. Well, some are like not like the power nine, for example, but most of these are, are format legal. You just like they're legal, but just like for, for, for better people, you know, like people who, people who can afford them or people who played the game for so long. Like, like it doesn't matter how much you individually love the game. You didn't love it 20 years ago, so you don't deserve to love it like I do. You don't deserve yeah. it. I just, I have, I have a problem with that, right? Like, there's... It feels very gatekeeper-esque. Well, I, hmm. you know what I mean? I have, uh, for anyone who's, like, seen me stream it, a lot of times when I play, like, everyone on stream, I play my group hug deck with Kenrith. It runs all of the dual lands. I think I've won one game with that deck out of, like, the probably 50, 60 games I've played with it. It's not meant for that. It's, like, meant to have fun. It goes off. Like, I do lots of cool things with it. But, like, I'm not, like, doing broken things with it. Like, it's yeah, a fun thing. Texas. Yeah, like, people, like, are... People want to play the game. And a lot of a lot of the problem with this is that, like, other people get to play the game. And you just get to, like, have, like, worse versions of it available. Because, like, oh, yeah, like, well, there's always the argument of, well, you can get around it this way. Or, like, there's other options. But, like... The point is, like, it would be nice if we could all put dual lands in our decks and, like, just, like, have them be a normal thing. We'd be happy with that. If mm -hmm. duels had, like, the price tag of, like, shocks or even expensive shocks, even if they were $50 cards, people would still really like it. It would upgrade the ability to play their deck. You're not going to run it in everything, but you might be able to just have that little more consistency in three color decks. Most of the most popular commanders are three or, plus, three or more colors. Like, you've got Najila, you have Moldrotha, Golos is one of the most popular. Like, people people like to play more colors, and the barrier to that is the price tag. The price tag of a functional land base. Yeah, you can do Guild Gates and hope that you draw an Amulet of Vigor turn one. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's, I mean, fundamentally, we play a game. Well, and, and that's, that's my big is issue. It's a game. game. Like, I, I want to play, I don't want to, like, I don't want to get together at the country club with some rich friends and... You know, like have some martinis. Oh, no, I I wanna. I just wanna. That would play. be kind of fun. Though. I just wanna <laughs> play with like my my other friends who love this game. Like I want to see what their best idea is. Not hey, like I had to. It's between fixing my car or getting Candelabra of Thanos. You know. Yeah, like looking at some of these prices of these cards, like the Tundra and Underground Sea. I, for one, will never own one in my lifetime. <laughs> Brian, you're also because I'm assuming because I'm assuming these prices are American dollars, yep. and not our moose bucks. Yeah, but they're also you're not. I think a lot of the prices you're probably seeing are also Alpha Beta Unlimited, not Revised. But even Revised duels are. I don't think you can touch a Revised duel for under three hundred bucks now, and all the good ones are closer to like six, seven, eight hundred dollars. For a dual land like i have a my rada deck i was looking at possibly getting a taiga and taigas are like 450 dollars, and i was like nope a revised underground c at the moment with the current buyout is 1250 dollars wow i'm stupid i'm so glad i got my my three lands for negan when i was playing legacy mm -hmm. yeah. gaius cradle 1100 dollars. that's stupid a limited no, brain geyser a thousand dollars why Going back to what you said about everyone should have access to playing with these cards because it's fundamentally a game. Ah, sorry guys, we had a quick glitch in the recording there. Uh, Lotus, go ahead and jump back into that point you were making. Yeah, so in regards to um, players deserve to play with these reserve list cards, Wizards actually say on their actual website, word for word, we choose to reprint cards because we believe, A, the cards we reprint make for an enjoyable gameplay, and B, all Magic players deserve an opportunity to play with these cards. Any card that isn't on the reserve list may be reprinted. So it's kind of like, yes, you deserve to play with absolutely everything except these. Well, and, and yeah, we were, we were talking, like I said, we just had to restart part of it there. We had a glitch in my program. Just in general, people want to get these cards. You just don't have a spot to go get them. It's not that you don't want to buy packs. It's not that. It's 
you you literally have to go back so long, longer than many players have been alive. You'd have to go back to like be able to just access these cards in any meaningful way, right? Because like currently, currently just hoping that they're in a store or online is not meaningful, right? They're not accessible. They're, that's my big problem is that you just can't get them. Where do you get them? So the reserve list basically goes against everything that they said in that paragraph. Except for the reserve list. Yeah. They, they've they even right. asterisked their own statement. Yeah. Like, so that, we were, that's, that's funny. I, that... <laughs> we were kind of talking during the pregame show about if the, they were to, I don't know, if they were to abolish the reserve list or start to let things off of it, how would you introduce it back into the game? And like, we were even talking you about, are... to, well, no, the, no, 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 no. We were even talking like fetch lands. Like if they wanted to, they don't want fetch lands in standard. They've banned them in, in pioneer because they don't want them around. But if you were to put a fetch land, like let's say a, a scalding turn, I think scalding turns are still a hundred dollars. If you were to put a scalding turn in a commander product, all the modern players would just buy up all the par- commander product because it would pay sixty bucks for the deck to get their hundred dollar card. Oh yeah. So if you well, took they're already doing it for the dock side. If you were to take something like a dual land and you were to say, okay, we're going to reprint the duels, but we clearly don't want them in standard, so we're not going to put them in a standard legal set. We're going to put them in a commander product. You would never be able. To, commander players would never be able to get the commander product. Unless you're unless you're in bed with your FLGS and they hook you up, because it would be gone, and they would like the second they hit the shelves, all the legacy <laughs> players or all the people who want to play legacy would buy them up to get them for their format. I think they would just have to bring back gold border cards. Like that's I think the only way to really do it efficiently. Like either, uh, that, efficiently. either that or like secret layer dual lands, and well, you just but, go on wizard set and you buy your 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 hundred dollar pack of ten dual lands. Well, the problem with that, though, is that they, again, they wouldn't be able to print to demand is is a lie to them. They are every secret layer is six months late because there's too much demand. They and that's like with like silly things. That's like, oh, here's some landfall cards from Zendikar. You know, here's an alt art royal elemental. You you jam like plateau into it. Good luck. You've just like made that product take two years. (laughs) That's my that's my winter 2024 drop. But you know what? If I, if I if I could pay thirty bucks to get a plateau, I'd wait a year. No, I'd still complain about that. Uh, me earlier in the episode, stop complaining at Wizards. Me when my <laughs> secret layer is a day late. Where is it? <laughs> but I, Where's that? Just, if they were to if they were to take you know a boss or reserve or some of these, who cares? Like you could put Mountain Goat in the next twenty five core sets and nobody would bat an eye, and it wouldn't change anything. I so would. Stop. Of course, I've added an eye at the Dreadmaw being in five sets. Whatever, but y- you get my point. Like some of these that are just functional oh, it's use- garbage. It's, it's functional useless garbage. cards being reprinted. Well, the, but there's going to be that in every set ever. But you no. get my point. Like some of these cards are not th- not good enough that it would matter. But if you take cards that are good, like how do you get them back into the into the hands of of the masses so that they or man. Them? Format specific sets. I I do uh, really like the idea of gold border, but gold border then only fixes the problem for us, right? And like yeah. as as much as we all love our format and it's the best format, and all the other formats aren't good, the uh, other formats also kind of want these cards as well. And like if you make them not tournament legal, then that's pretty much like saying like EDH players kind of eat your hearts out. The only the only problem though, even with gold border and like we touched on proxies, though, is if you go to a Grand Prix and you want to play in one of their, you can play gold border or Grand Prix. Can you? Yep, they're just not tournament legal. EDH has no tournaments. Uh, but when you're paying money at an event, yep, that's just an I'm event. I'm not talking like. Okay, I, I wasn't aware. I I it's been so long and. I, I didn't think you could even use gold border. And wizards can wizards can give you a proxy at the event. Like if your card becomes damaged or uh like mm-hmm. like you were saying with the Nexus of Fate example, right? It's really yeah. easy for them to just be like, hey, here you go. I mean it would be cool to get, you know, reserve list gold border like the world champ decks, except it's a the reserve list deck. I just love to- I wish they would do the world champ decks again. I think those are so cool. They're one of my Another thing that, like, I wish I would have been around playing when they were coming out, not for the value, but just because I thought it was a very interesting deck. They do it all the time with Pokemon. 
Pokemon think they world stopped. Impact all the time. I think they stopped because they weren't super popular because they, those are one of the then, first things I played with. Well, but back then, like back when they really were around, Commander really didn't exist. So you were just buying them to just play the best deck with your buddy. Yeah. You could most com- competitive people had all the cards and played those decks. So it's kind of. I'm just curious if some a product like that now would be more viable if people would be more interested you know what i mean like if we would be given you know these world championship decks from a specific year and suddenly it has two or three fetch lands in it and you know the force of will or city of traders or something like that that we've seen in earlier decks would that would people be more interested in them now like i would probably buy those People at the local game store we are buy the Challenger decks, and they're really watered-down versions of top-tier standard decks. Mm-hmm. That's true. <laughs> they they actually oh, are pretty I, solid ones. I've I've bought them just to play a few standard events when I'm bored. And they I have just shot ones in them. The, the Commander Anthology sets come back. Those were... Those were pretty great ones, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. those are what got me into Commander. I picked that up for... What, 150 bucks got four decks out of it and away we went the um <laughs> now i'm here <laughs> the reserve list as well it, it's going to be interesting to see where they actually go with it i personally think that they're going to break it they've been in my opinion testing the waters on public outcry when they are printing things that are similar you, we just saw the jeweled lotus we just saw like the Kaldheim snow duels we saw the triome lands right i think they are trying to push and see what people would like and you know what I mean? Like I said, if, if it's 1% of the player base or 2% or 5% that are mad, but 35 million people like start buying more product, that like the money talks to wizards, right? So yeah, I, I think I is. think they're undoubtedly going to break it. And I also believe that Magic is moving away from tournament formats. And like I I am our competitive player of the group when it comes to EDH and stuff. I, I love playing like the competitive games, but I've outwardly said many times, there's no future for a tournament-based four-man EDH game. Like, you're not going to play CEDH with four people because it's too easy for me to... I've got Fall of the Titans on the stack. I have 40 damage to Brian and 40 damage to Zach. And Zach on his way out, Cyclonic Rifts, I end up losing the game because someone else. It's too chaotic of a format to be able to spite play people. Zach can't stop the Fall of the Titans, but he decides he's going to exile my commander or he's going to blow up like my Gaia's cradle so I can't do it on the way out there's it's too easy to spite play people and it's too chaotic everyone else answers your problems for you you're not really doing anything yourself I don't like that you insinuated I would ever play Cyclonic Rev no no but (laughs) (laughs) Zach's Zach's a good man Brian plays the Cyclonic Rift but that's what I mean right like in a chaos format it's too (laughs) I just think that there's too many, too much potential for spite, and like that is what it is. It's a spite 100%. play, one hundred percent. Yeah, like it's uh, it's too easy to. I can't win, but I can beat you. It's too many of that format, right? So I like being spiteful. Like that. I think it shows it shows people's like uh, characteristics because like I. As I'm going out, I usually go, do you know what? Like, I could do this. Like, I could be spiteful. Like, I could beast within this creature or something along those lines. But I, typically, I won't mm-hmm. because I, I'm i out. I'm done. I'm going to be out of the game. I should have no impact on what's currently happening. Well, but, I'm the uh, dead opposite. If uh, I'm going out, I want to wreck the game as much as I can. Yeah, like, a really good example <laughs> is, like, you've got, you're swinging Azuri Claw of Progress, right? Every turn, you're buffing your creatures. You swing out to kill me. I have three blockers. Three of them, for some reason, have death touch. You swing out at me. I just kill your three best creatures on the way out. There's nothing I'm doing is stopping me from dying. I'm still taking your crater hoof 100 plus creatures. But I just take your three best creatures out on the way with me because, like, why not? Right? Like, that's why I don't think that EDH is ever going to have a tournament circuit. Like, I, I, I don't really know what the future of a competitive one would be. And like one V one EDH is so watered down and boring. Like it's, if you play with the full EDH list, like that's what I like to do. It's a great time. But every time you see any one, one V one EDH, like format, even tiny leaders is a good example. They ban everything combo worthy. They ban all fast explosive plays. Like they don't want to see like a turn one mana crypt. They don't want to see a soul ring. Right. Uh, you don't want to have like an Edgar Markov in your one-on-one like dual commander. Everyone always 
wants these more they try and make it a competitive format and then water it down so that you can't like explosively play i just i, I don't see a solution to real fun like competitive games like short of watering them down to like mid-range like you know turn turn eight turn nine combat win things you're you're not going to see it everyone's going to play their one land a turn pass it on and every deck's a jun deck <laughs> well, and ever I mean, all, the format is a casual format. It was designed that way. We build our decks to combat four people and to play that kind of a format. And when you like, if you're going to play one v one competitive, why wouldn't you just play standard, modern, or pioneer? Well, yeah, something that actually has prizing support. I will say, our our local game store does have one version of like a tournament EDH, which is so fun. That's the big game. I would love to, yeah. I would love to do Mega. We got to do an episode <laughs> just on Mega Commander, even a short one. It's such a fun format, but like, I would love to do like a big GP event where there was like two hundred people playing a Mega Commander game. That yeah. would be fun. Yeah, there'd be like nine, there'd be like ninety nine turns going all at once. You'd okay. start. You'd start the event on Friday, and it would end on Friday the next week. Oh, it it ends. <laughs> oh no! It ends no. much quicker than that. Um the the jet like the basis of it is that like you can only see players x amount of distance and there's multiple turns coming in but like if like like right now there's five of us on screen for instance right i'd be able to see everyone but if there was a sixth person and i killed brian that sixth person is suddenly in the game and if they haven't been like affected by like my stacks pieces or something and they just come in and they're they're on 20 lands for some reason then, like, you're tapped out because you killed Brian, and suddenly, like, he's like, oh, I have Merit Lage with haste. Go! <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah, like, it's, like, players come in to play, and like I said, you're not paying attention because you're only really playing it with the people in vision, right? You can't affect them. Board wiping, if, if I board wipe everyone here, and then, like, Brian dies the next turn to his mana crypt flip or something. And someone comes in someone, like 100 Yeah, elves. someone rolls in, like, in, like, a zombie deck. They're playing, like, Jissa. And they have like Jesus. fifth, yeah, exactly. They just roll. So, but in. if you're, so if you're two away, so like if I was the middle and I could see Brian and I could see you, Dan, but then Brian would be affected by me and two other people that weren't you and Zach. Yes, exactly. So Brian has seen different oh, people. Yes. So like if there's like <laughs> if if there's like like I said, the five of us, I could see everyone, but I couldn't see like for instance, if Lotus is like player five and Zach is player one. I could not see who was beside Lotus. I could not see who was beside Zach. And if either of them die for some reason, the people beside them just come into frame with whatever they have out, with whatever, like, so suddenly, so, like, you have a Torbrand deck that has a fiery emancipation because no one in that field could deal with him. Or So what I want to do is I want to play a deck that makes an infinitely large walking ballista and just be like, okay, no. very, 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 very fun. So very, very fun so, with that. As soon as a player dies, the stack gets exiled, and they exile one permanent of yours on death. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, no, no. The, if the stack doesn't exile, you either get to exile something off of the stack or a permanent. Yeah, so like oh ev God. every ability. Oh, and because it's a prize-based <laughs> format, uh, you, only get point, you only get a money prize if the person to the left of you dies. So, like I said, in a Fall of the Titans situation, if Zach is to the left of me, Brian's to the left of me, and I kill both at the same time, like, if uh, if Zach is number one, Brian's number two, I will only get the prizing for killing Zach because they die at the same time. Oh. And Zach, even though he dies, will be the person who gets the Brian prize. <laughs> Just no. don't ask me to judge this. It no. is <laughs> so fun. It is like the it most... Seems fun, but it also seems like a massive headache. Oh, I'm it, so confused. it goes I'm really, really lost. fast, actually. Like, it's... Like, I'm, it's <laughs> normal. Like, basically, we played, I think, a 15-player game, and it was still done in an hour and a half. Okay, so if, if, if we ever do Commander the Vacationing, we're going to try to get some extra people to come up and play this format. If you... <laughs> when you guys come down for a visit, like you and Benson and stuff, and Zach, and Lotus, get over here, yeah. We will... Like, our LGS will play this game. Like, we will have, like, a 20-man game, no problem. All right. It's very fun. Like I said, I am horrible to play with. I bribe players. Twenty dollars <laughs> to kill Zach. Let's go. I'm done. <laughs> Zach, we're fighting. <laughs> um, I so what I've done to anger everyone, but okay. Yeah. But on that note, we should abolish the reserve list. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I wanted to. I just wanted to end off with like our own personal thoughts on the reserve list, like because everyone's there. There's no right or wrong answer. It's either like you don't agree or you're wrong. But well. 
So there's definitely a right or wrong yeah. answer. Uh, we'll we'll just go in order. Ryan, you you start us off uh, here with like how you feel about the reserve list in general. I I don't I like parts of it and I don't like it. I think that most cards should be accessible to all. Um, I just want to play commander and I want people to play cards and I want to have access to cards so I can build more stuff and do more stuff. I think they should just revise it and maybe put some of the, you know, the things that we have on our ban list, just keep them on there, like the power and stuff. They don't need to, they don't need to come off of it, but like dual lands and some of the stupid stuff, just take it off and get it back into the hands of players so we can enjoy more formats. Lotus? So I was on the fence. I was definitely against it. And then being a judge, I get judge promos, which aren't the reserve list esque, but they're still a limited product. But you can get alternate versions on the actual market. I kind of actually like the reserve list in that instance, but I do believe that some cards need to be revised and come off it. Brian, you can go next here. So I I I'm I was on the fence as well, or no, I was more on like one foot on the side of I like the reserve list and maybe like my lag's starting to go over. Um but like I I get my cards at a certain price and I, I do I do like to collect. Like I, I like to collect certain cards, like certain artwork, like the the expeditions and the artifacts like uh or the invocations and things like that like i love mm-hmm. those cards um i think that if if we were to get reserve reserved list cards that we should have them in a special type of art if they were to be reprinted so um, they're still like kind of collectible yeah exactly like okay like you won't get them in the same art that we previously printed them in those that will say the same but Maybe in this new set coming out, we will have special art with a special border, and there's only so many. So they're still collectible. They're still a little bit. So I think harder I think, to get. But. I think if they were to be reprinted, anyways, they'd have to have new art right off the bat because I believe artists of a certain like era in Magic have the rights to their art. That's why we don't see like demonic tutor as it is now, or as it is now versus how it was. Yeah, I think. So, I do think you're right that, like, the Wizards Owns This came much later. Mm -hmm. I think you would get your wish on that one, Brian. 100%. There's actually some cards that the artists... Some (laughs) cards... Wizards did not pay, like, a flat rate and say, hey, I'll give you $1,000 to draw art for Ollie from Cairo. What they did is they said... The artist would say, I'll draw Ollie from Cairo, and then you give me a tenth of a cent for every single copy of Ollie from Cairo you print. Mm -hmm. So then when they reprint the card, they choose a different artist so that they don't have to give them royalties for the reprints of the cards. That makes sense. A classic example, the back of the magic card. The guy that drew the back of the magic card gets a tenth of a cent from every single magic card ever printed. And he still has that right. Making bank. If I was Wizards, I would assassinate him. Do not do that. <laughs> Cut that out of our... <laughs> I'm just saying it adds up. Wizards don't take my legal advice. <laughs> Disclaimer, Daniel is not a lawyer. Uh, Dan, what do you feel? Zach, I, I want to do Zach's first. Oh, Zach. Uh, F the reserve list. <laughs> just F it. <laughs> we don't need it. Um, I want everyone to be able to play whatever they want. Prices will be what they are. An Alpha Sarah Angel still going to be an Alpha Sarah Angel. There's only going to be so many that have ever been printed, opened, in good condition. I want all of you guys to be able to have whatever your heart desires. You want to buy you, Brian? Go get you a twenty-five dollar buy you. That's what I want for you. I uh, I I definitely do like that. My my view on it is I don't care about the value of my cards. I just want to play. I do not sell. I do not trade. I literally, for like the first time, I said like, hey, I'm thinking of maybe selling one of my cards because it seems irresponsible to keep it at this point. But like, yeah, I I don't trade my cards. I don't care. I'm not losing anything because they're going to sit there endlessly in EDH decks. I can't foresee any time in the future. I've played Magic pretty much my whole life. I'm not going to not play just suddenly like two years from now because I'm busy. You know, so... For me, I want to see people play more. I want to I want to play against the best ideas people have. I don't want to play against budgetary restrictions. And like I understand that for some people that's part of the fun. 
but I I just like to play against cool decks, cool ideas. I love seeing like the different ways people go about making decks. I love the fact that if the five of us made the same commander today, if I gave us a make a Golos deck challenge, we would not have the same Golos decks, right? I love to see like the creativity people put in. I love to see the time they do it. Like I love Zach's deck lists. Like I loved Tony's idea for like Squirrel Voltron Toski and stuff. Like Arkello's <laughs> awesome. I like I I like the way that Brian plays like Sovala. It's so very different than like I have two Sovala decks, and it's like a completely different deck. That's what I like so much about Magic. And the more people can play, the more they can actually get their hands on these cards, the more they can build, the more ideas I can see, and the better player I can become by going against this. Like dual lands don't wreck anything for you. They don't make the game better. Buy a back to basics and wreck my whole day. You know, like play Blood Moon and just watch me rage quit. <laughs> like it's you know what i mean there's there's answers to everything in magic right and like pr uh, price is one of those things that there is an answer to but at the same time i don't want everyone to have to like try like do the price thing like buy packs like the like we said before you would be able to sell out anything that you put like uh dual lands in any set it doesn't matter how good or bad the set was would completely sell out because people would want it right store owners are happier more people are coming into play because that's Vintage is a great example. No one plays it because that barrier to entry is monstrous. And EDH is already such a complex game. So looking through everything, especially as a new player, you look through it, you get such an exciting, oh, wow, this Anvil of Bow Garden is so awesome. It would be like the perfect thing for like my, my discard deck, you know, because I'll be able to pair it blah, blah, blah way. And then you find out it's $400. Like that's not a feel good experience for a lot of players, right? It's, oh, well, I guess I don't get this. I, I think the reserve list should just go away entirely. I think that anyone who wants to try w Sue Wizards should absolutely, you know, try. eat your heart out, but it's not going to work. <laughs> like you, again, there's precedent for them breaking it. No one sued them before. And these cards are still going to be valuable. They're, if the only 1,100 Black Lotuses were printed from Alpha, there's no way for them to not be valuable. And like Zach said, in good condition is a very, very different thing because like, I was a kid when I started playing this game. The fact that any of my cards are in like passable condition is awesome. I I, to, I joke with my friends all the time. Uh, I have a bazaar of Baghdad that was chewed by my parents' dog. It's the dog dish special one. I could probably still sell that for like five hundred dollars, and it has like bite marks through it. In good condition is a very very different thing. Like there's, it just blows me away. Like how many of these old like reserve list cards are probably like sitting in like a shed or like a landfill somewhere. They. They just don't exist anymore. Someone set them on fire. They ripped them because they were angry in a game. Like, yeah, there's there's not very many of these old cards. They're always going to be valuable. But, like, the the real real thing you should enjoy is playing with your friends, right? And we should want people to be able to play the game more and more. 100%. Yes. <laughs> also, just a, just a quick antidote on all this. And not everything, but if you look at a lot of the stuff that's on the reserve list, like Juzon Jin, uh, 5-5 five, five for 4, and you take a damage every upkeep, there are way better cards that exist yeah. for the same mana. Like, why, other than age and collectability, who cares if they reprint that? Like, Questing Beast is, mind you, it's green. It's way better than a Juzom Jin. The big problem is that, like, the cards are wildly expensive, and some are terrible. Some are just yeah. trash cards. Like, some are so, Pyramids. so bad. Angus McKenzie is not a very good card. It's like, you can, like, tap Bant Colors to prevent combat damage, there's so many other options to just prevent combat damage. Like, it's not a good card. It's, like, a fun, like, a $50 commander, maybe I could see a $20 commander, maybe. But, like, if they reprinted it, like, you would obviously, like, not pay $500, is it now, for Angus McKenzie? Like, and then, like so, you said, you've got, like, you've got these old gins, like, you have, like, pyramids. Like, a lot of the cards aren't good. Yeah, pyramids is six casting cost. Pay two mana, prevent a land from being destroyed, or remove an enchantment from any land. And currently on Star City, I'm like, how many of these cards can make the Star City doesn't always update? Yeah, like there's uh there's some good Pyramid. cards and there's some not good cards. Like I like I Pyramid said this is a two hundred dollar card right now. Mm -hmm. Card is garbage. <laughs> so yeah, that's our that's our quick take on the reserve list, what it is, why it is, and why it shouldn't be. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Yeah, definitely yeah. let us know if we're wrong. It's definitely an interesting topic to be had with the community. Yeah, we've and had a, a 
conversation in our Discord. So I'm interested to see what the the greater whole of you have to say on this. Yeah, day or night, people want to talk about the reserve list and why it should go away. You can always <laughs> chat me up on our Discord because I will I will engage with you. <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> yeah. I have I have thoughts on it for sure. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Brian, let them know where they can find us. So you can check us out on our website, into the 99.com. It is our one-stop shop for all things into the 99. Uh, on there, you can find articles written by members of the community. You can find uh, our links to our YouTube channel, the most, uh, the newest videos, as well as Lotus's new uh, series, uh, Brewing It Live, where she brews uh, decks every Sunday. Uh, you can find out our weekly streams on Tuesday, and I believe Lotus will bring us a Saturday stream as well. Uh, and if you wish to support us, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash into the 99 and our merch store. You can find links to that uh, below and in our, on our website as well. With that, have a good one. Um, don't forget Edge Gaming. Yes, as well, our sponsor Etch Gaming, where you can find any like nifty uh, <clears throat> I can't lose some words for this. Uh, nifty uh, like commander trays, uh, token ability tokens everything you need to increase your gameplay also if you guys find us on apple podcasts please leave us a like and a review it greatly helps other people find us thank you so much for listening good night everybody night